Good evening. Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you to the, if this is working, I'd like to welcome you all to the second night of the Ulam Lectures uh, hosted by the Santa Fe Institute and to welcome all of you on behalf of the Institute. I'm Doug Irwin. I'm a uh, research scientist at the Smithsonian in Washington here for you on sabbatical and looking forward a great deal to this evening's talk, the second of three in the lecture series this year. Uh, I assume most of you were probably here last night. You know that the lectures are being given this year by Professor Richard Lewinton, the Alexander Agassiz Professor um, at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. Dr. Lewinton is one of the most noted population geneticists and evolutionary biologists of his generation, and we're enormously happy to have him here this year. The title of this evening's lecture is The Organism as Subject and Object of Evolution. Uh, I'm particularly looking forward to this component of the three lectures because it will touch on some uh, very different ways of looking at the evolutionary process that in my view and the view I think of many evolutionary biologists will substantially change the way we look at um, many of the important events in the history of life. Um, and so without further ado, Professor Richard Lewinton. Am I switched on? I'm switched yes. on. Okay. Uh, for those of you who were here last night, um, I want to apologize for being up here now instead of down there where I belong, but a, a lot of people couldn't hear me, especially when I drop my voice at the end of sentences at the end of jokes. So uh, I've been convinced that I better stand up here and try to talk to you. But you understand that these lights are in my eyes and I can't see you. And because I can't see you, it's hard for me to talk to you. No, no, that's true. So, uh, no, 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 definitely you won't hear me if I'm down there. So we'll see what we can do up here. We'll take a vote at the end and see what to do uh, tomorrow night. Um, what I want to talk about tonight essentially concerns two very powerful metaphors in biology uh, which, are which are relevant to our understanding of the evolutionary process. Uh, the one I chiefly want to talk about is the metaphor of adaptation. Uh, the notion that organisms during evolution adapt to the environment. I want to challenge that metaphor. It is a metaphor. The word adaptation means literally to be changed in order to fit something that is pre-existing. Like when you go to Europe, and you, they have crazy 210 volts or something, you have to carry an adapter with you so that your hair dryer works. Uh, keys are adapted to fit locks. Adapted means literally made fit to, apt to something that already exists. And indeed, Darwin's use of the word fit, as in fitness, uh, has to be taken literally. He really meant that the organism fit into some pre-existent uh, uh, structure in the world, what ecologists now call the ecological niche of the organism. And the whole notion of niche, of some sort of hole in the world, in the external world, into which the organism fits rather like uh, an antibody-antigen relationship. If you're a molecular biologist, that will, uh, you'll appreciate that. But you, you, get, you get the point. And I want to challenge that notion that organisms evolve to fit pre-existing ecological niches and that the whole metaphor of adaptation is the wrong metaphor. And I want to propose a different way of understanding uh, the evolutionary process. This does not challenge the notion of natural selection, but challenges the notion that what natural selection does is to adapt organisms to a pre previously existing world outside of them. Um, before I do that, I have to deal briefly, I hope, because I need a lot of time for the other, uh, 
I'll try to get it through it briefly, with another metaphor, which is a very powerful one, uh, or another set of metaphors, uh, having to do with genes and the role of genes in the, uh, in the uh, development of organisms. Uh, if you are so unfortunate as to read uh, the New York Times or other kinds of reports of, uh, of, of science in the national press, uh, or textbooks for that matter, uh, you will be impressed with the fact that genes make organisms. Everybody knows that. Uh, indeed, um, I heard what is who, the person who is perhaps the leader or one of the great leaders of modern molecular biology uh, giving a speech at the 100th anniversary of the death of Darwin. I was gonna, it's not the, commemorating, not celebrating, but commemorating the 100th anniversary. And he was the keynote speaker uh, for some curious reason. And among the things he said was, if you give me, we're at the stage in biology, where if you give me the complete DNA sequence of an organism and a large enough computer, I could compute the organism. Now I have to say that despite his great contributions to biology, that's just rubbish. It's rubbish because no organism computes itself from its own DNA. There's missing information. There's very important missing information and, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the state of the genes is not sufficient to specify the organism. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes on that uh, because it's quite important to get away from that kind of determinist, gene determinist view of organism in order to go on to the more important question, or not the more important, but the one I'm trying to develop tonight. So the first thing I want to convince you of is uh, that genes do not make organisms that organisms are a consequence that develop. I'm gonna talk about the development of organisms. I don't have time tonight to discuss that metaphor, development. But development means an unfolding, a coming out of the envelope. Uh, in, for those of you who are Hispanic, it's desarrollo, an unrolling. In German, it's entwicklung. You know what entwickles? Entwickle, well, if, you, if you have a ball of yarn and you throw it on the ground, it entwickles, that's what entwicklung is. It's an unrolling or unfolding of a pre-existent pattern. And organisms do not develop either. It is, uh, some of you may be aware of the fact that there was a great struggle in the history of biology between the so-called pre-formationists who believed that the organisms were already contained in miniature in the sperm. And you sometimes see pictures of little men huddled inside the sperm. Uh, the, the, the egg was only nutritive. It didn't have any important. Uh, well, that was the view. The real organism was in the sperm. And all that little organism did was to get bigger. That was preformationism. Whereas epigeneticists said, no, no, that's not right. It is a process of epigenesis in which the organism actually comes into form and creates new forms during its process of development. And uh, the history of biology says, of course, no fool believes there's a little man in a sperm. And that. Uh, uh, it's the epigenesis who won the struggle. That's what all the history of science books tell us. But it's not true. It's the preformationists who won the struggle. Because I have to ask you to consider what is the difference between the claim that the sperm has a little man in it and that the sperm has the complete information necessary to make the little man. It's a matter of mechanics, but not very interesting difference. The important difference is that it doesn't, there, there is no unrolling of a pre-existent fixed program uh, to make the organism. And we need to get that straight before we can go on to the more important, or the other point. Now to try to convince you of that, and, and people will say, well of course everybody knows the environment has some role. After all, even if you have genes that would make you fat, if you starved yourself, you'd be thin. So there must be environments in which no matter, you know, no matter how fat your genes are, you'll be thin. But that view is contained in a, a general view of the relationship between organism and environment, which is contained in the first. See, I think Susan deserves our. Uh, no, no wiggling, please, no. <laughs> no scene stealing. Uh, I take this, uh, this, is a, this is taken from a famous paper in the Harvard Educational Review by Arthur Jensen, who wrote about IQ, and it shows that notion. Yes, the environment matters in what your IQ is. This is one genotype which if it's deprived has a low IQ, and if it's enriched has a higher one, sorry. Uh, the next one is another genotype, which is above that one, and so on. In other words, the differences in genes 
are the differences between the curves. The environment makes that difference. Right? And the notion is that if you have lousy genes, you have a, the worst possible IQ, no matter what environment you're in, even though the environment is making the IQ higher, the order in which these are remains the same. Is that a point clear? A uh, bad environment makes poor IQ, but if you've got good genes, you still have a better IQ than, than if you don't. Uh, that's not the truth. And you really have to uh, abolish this notion of the relationship between organism, gene, and environment. That's wrong. Uh, and we should remove it instantly from the uh, from the consciousness of our audience. Thank you. Um, the truth has been known for a long time uh, by experimental biologists. And uh, the most dramatic demonstration of what the real truth is about the relationship between gene, environment, and, and organism are a set of cloning experiments. Uh, cloning experiments done in the 1930s. You may not realize it, but cloning has been going on for a long time. Because there are a bunch of organisms called plants which are absurdly easy to clone. You take a scissors and you clip them into three pieces and you stick the three pieces in the ground and lo and behold they grow up into three copies of the same genes. Uh, and you can ask the question, what would happen if I took one piece of the plant and stuck it in one environment, another piece in another environment, another piece in another environment, what would they look like? And the most famous set of experiments like that were done by uh, colleagues in California, Klaus and Keck and Heise, on a plant called Achillea, and I want to show you photographs of the results they got, because these contain the truth about the relationship between internal and external information in the uh, development of organisms. And uh, Susan, if we could have this one, please, in that orientation. Uh, these are photographs, or they're tracings of photographs, of the results, if, if you could move it down a bit, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. What's shown here are seven different plants uh, taken from the wild, cut into three pieces. One piece grown at low elevation, one piece grown at medium elevation, and one piece grown at high elevation in the Sierras. This is a different plant, a different set of genes. Low elevation, medium elevation, high elevation. So you go up this way, you're changing the environment. You go this way, you're changing the genes. Is that clear to everyone what the very simple experiment. And they organized it in such a way that they put the plants in descending order of their growth uh, at low elevation. And now let's see what happened at medium elevation. Well, the very best grower at low elevation turned out to be the lousiest grower at medium elevation. It turned out to be the, actually the best at high elevation. Uh, the second best was probably the third best, at, uh, the third worst at medium elevation and just about the worst at high elevation, and so on. If you look at them, what you see is there's no relationship between the ordering of growth rate and growth pattern at the low elevation to the one at medium or the one at high. There's no, in fact, if you measure these, there's no correlation at all between the growth in the three environments. Therefore, there's no predictability. It is not the case that the thing that grows best here will also grow best here and best here. On the contrary, there's no predictability at all. Uh, that is to say, uh, Jensen's view of the world is not right. What actually happens is that the curves showing plant, and, and also flowering shows this peculiar result. If you plotted the plant height against the environment, you would find that the, that the curves crossed each other. For example, let me ask you, which of these genetic types grows best? I, I challenge my, my, my uh, developmental biologist uh, to take out his computer, I'll give you the complete DNA sequence of all of these, and predict, please, which one will grow best, period. And the answer is you can't, because you have, you've lost an important piece of information, namely, in what environment are the organisms grown. And if I don't know that, I don't know the answer to the question. And that's the big truth, or the first big truth, about the relationship between development and, um, and, and genes, namely that organisms don't develop. That is to say, they don't unfold a pre-existent program. They are in the constant situation of, of creation uh, during the process of, I don't know what to call it, the only word we have is development, during their life history. Okay. So that's the chief point I want, that's point A of the chief point I want. Point B is that even if I tell you 
the genes and the environment, I still haven't got all the information I need to specify the organism. There's a third feature. Uh, that third feature you can convince yourself of if when you go home, you will all please go to the mirror, hold up your hands, and look at the fingerprints on your left and right hands. And you will find for the vast majority of you that their fingerprints on your left hand are quite different from the fingerprints on your right hand. In fact, they look like they come from somebody completely different. Francis Galton, one of the most famous of the early geneticists, uh, I've seen his fingerprints, and they're just utterly different on one hand than the other. Some of you will have very similar ones on both sides, uh, not identical, but similar. Uh, if I count the number of hairs on the armpits of fruit flies, uh, on the average they have the same number on uh, wing pits, I guess I should call them, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, but one fly will have seven here and five there, and the other one will have six here and four there, and so there's what's called fluctuating asymmetry. Now, what is the origin of fluctuating asymmetry? The genes are the same on the left and the right-hand side. The environment in which your hands developed in those crossed arms in the womb of your mother. You could hardly say, well, there's an average difference in environment on the left and the right-hand side. It doesn't seem reasonable. Yet, they come out very different. What is the origin of that asymmetry? And the answer, briefly, I would give a whole lecture on that if I had four lectures instead of three, is that the molecules in your cells are in very small numbers. Like there are three of those, and seven of those, and five of those. And they're in particular places in the cell and for the cell to divide and undergo its development, I have to use the word development, it's, it's change, uh, those molecules have to be in the right place at the right time to interact with each other. And there's a lot of random noise inside the cell. So randomness comes into play again. And the consequence of that random noise, and we have a lot of experimental evidence about it, as well as, as uh, theoretical work, is that Two cells which have identical genes and are side by side in the organism or in equivalent places on the left and right hand side will not divide at the same time, will not move in the same way, uh, will do different things. If I sow a single bacterial cell into a huge vat of rich culture medium, after about an hour it will divide into two. Then those two will divide into two each to produce four, but they won't do it simultaneously. First one will divide, and then a little later the other one will divide. And then if I take those four, first one will divide, and then another one, and then another one. Why is it that those cells are not dividing simultaneously? After all, they're living in a, in a huge vat of rich, uniform medium, which is being stirred, so there are no environmental differences. And there are no genetic differences. After the first three or four generations of, of cell division, there are no mutations. Not, can't be very many, if any. What's the source of that variation? The source, again, is if you had to have seven molecules in order to divide, of a particular kind, after the division, one cell has four and one cell has three at best. And so therefore, it takes different times for the two cells to come up to full complement before they can divide again. So random variation, what's generally called developmental noise, is very important for organisms. And if you want to see an example of developmental noise, this is the last thing I'm going to say about this sub-issue, let me show you a case history about developmental noise which some of you may even recognize. Could we uh, have that one? Uh, I don't know how many people in this room are old enough to know who this is. Uh, these are the famous Dion quintuplets, identical quintuplets born to a, a rural, poor rural family in Ontario. These girls were not only genetically identical, but as a consequence of the entrepreneurship of the doctor who delivered them together with the uh, with the province of Ontario, were brought up in a kind of zoo in which people paid to watch them. And during their upbringing, you notice they were all identically clad, identically shod, they're identically quaffed. Uh, every effort was made to enforce identity of environment on these five girls who were also genetically identical. So if the environment's identical, I mean, it's criminal what was done to them. And not until they reached puberty could they rebel against that. They were literally in a kind of, of luxurious prison in which you could go and watch them being, being homogenized. Uh, under those circumstances, one would expect that when they grew up, they'd all be identical, right? But as a matter of fact, when they all grew up, they didn't turn out to be identical. Uh, two of them tried a religious vocation. One of them failed, one succeeded. Three got married. Uh, two had children. 
Uh, one died at the age of, now I'm going to have to throw a number because it's too long since I read the book, uh, 18 uh, of, uh, in, in, of, in, in, of a mental disorder, uh, having a mental disorder and died. Another one uh, uh, probably committed suicide, but she is pretty clear she committed suicide at another age. And the three survivors have lives as different from one another as any three girls growing up in a poor rural Ontario family could have. And I want to show you a picture of the three girls, no, no longer girls, who are very angry about what was done to them, but who are very different from one another in their life histories. So the five people had very different life histories, including life and death, including mental disorder, including religious uh, uh, interest and so on. And they are holding a sign that says, we want justice, not charity. I mean, they want to be paid back for what was done to them. But you notice, they look alike. I mean, sure, they're, you can tell they're sisters. But I wouldn't have guessed more than that. Uh, well, you know, OK, even identical triplets. Um, their noses are the same shape. Uh, they've accentuated the differences among them by cutting their hair differently, and so on and so forth. But what I'm trying to emphasize to you is that identical genes and identical environment did not make identical individuals. They made individuals who differed. What's the source of that? Why did some become nuns and others not? Why did some marry and others not? Why did some have children and others not? Why did some die early and some die and then some haven't died? Presumably, again, this is a kind of developmental noise in the nervous system, a developmental noise in the, in the endocrine system and so on, which made them different in some way. Okay. I just thought you'd like a concrete view of that rather than just graphs. Okay. Um, so, what organ, so the story about our, no, let's leave it on for a sec because I want to sum it up, if I may, uh, by a picture. Uh, well, forget, yeah, here it is. Uh, first this one, if I may, and then that one. The first picture shows three different plans that one can imagine for organisms. In plan one, the genes matter. There are different environmental factors. They're the input into the development of the organism. There's plan A, which is one set of genes, and plan B, which is a different set. And so plan A leads to one kind of organism, and plan B leads to another, irrespective of these environmental factors, which are general inputs. That's the model of genetic determination, which I'm challenging. The second one is the opposite. Namely, it's environmental determination, and the genes only provide the sort of generalized input. So you have environment one, which puts you on that pathway, environment two, B, which puts you on that pathway. There are general genetic rules, genes matter here, but the difference between organisms in this scheme is entirely environmental, right? Whether you decide uh, to be uh, a, a Baptist or, a, or an Episcopalian. Uh, the usual uh, story, if we could sort of just raise it a little bit, Susan, uh, yeah, is to put them both together and say genes and environment both matter. Uh, here's gene, genotype A and gene type B. Here's environment one, type 1 and type 2. And they come together to produce different kinds of organisms. And the result is a unique combination of genes and environment. And you can't predict just from one. But what I'm trying to tell you is it's even more complicated than that and that's the, the last picture, that most development is really like this. There are different types of gene sets. There are different types of environments. But even those combinations of gene and environment do not specify organism. But there's variation among the organisms, even when they have identical genes and identical environment. And that's the noise component. And most of what we know about higher organisms, and even in bacterial development, uh, uh, division rather, tell us that this is the story of organisms in their relationship to genes and environment. Now, that's just sort of the beginning of what I want to say. We, we need to get that straight before we get to the big message. And I, that's why I've spent some time on it. The relationship between gene, organism, and environment. Of that. Now I want to get to the big metaphor, and we, we could turn it off now, I think. Uh, the metaphor of adaptation, the notion that evolution is the process by which organisms come to fit the external environment which is there, and they move toward it and finally fit in. And that's the notion of, environmental, of, of, of the ecological niche. And I want, as a kind of mantra, 
which everyone should repeat every night before going to bed. Um, just as there is no organism without an environment, there is no environment without an organism. That is to say, we should not talk about the environment. There is no the environment. There is an environment for every organism, and I claim that that environment is not the result of the organism moving toward it, because that means it would have pre-existed. The environment is what is, as the word suggests, environ, around the organism. But what decides what's around the organism? It is the organism who, if I may put it that way, decides what's around it, which determine, what, that determines the actual nature of what surrounds it. Let me give you a practical example of the error of trying to describe an ecological niche in the world for an organism that you've never seen. That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to go out and divide up the world into bits and pieces. Oh, well, there's an unoccupied niche. There's an unoccupied niche. There's an occupied one. There's an, oh, most of them are unoccupied, of course. And you'd have to write them out. I defy any one of you to describe the niche of an organism you haven't seen. Or you could make it up out of your head. But, but somebody actually tried to do that in a very interesting way. When the Mars lander was being developed, there were two plans for Mars landers to detect life on Mars. One was Josh Lederberg's idea, which everybody thought was absurdly naive, and that was to use, a, uh, to send up a long, sticky tongue. The tongue would unroll, get some dust from Mars, come back in, and there would be an electron microscope which would look at the dust, and we'd see the, the, the result of what was being seen by the electron microscope, and if we saw things wiggle, we'd know there was life on Mars. Well, everybody says, that's silly, you know, I mean, wiggling? What kind of a definition of life is that? Uh, that's not scientific. So instead, they made up a scientific way of detecting life on Mars. Uh, although, by the way, the wiggling is what paleoecologists, uh, uh, paleobotanists do all the time when they're trying to find out when life originated. They look at rocks and see if there are things in them that look like they wiggled. Um, the scientific way was a the Mars lander that was actually made was not a, an electron microscope and a long sticky tongue. It was a big vacuum cleaner, a tank vacuum cleaner with a long hose. The hose went out of the lander, sucked up some dust. The dust went into the vacuum cleaner. Inside the vacuum cleaner tank was a, was a, was a, a medium which would allow any microorganisms to grow in it uh, by breaking down sugar. And the carbon in that medium was radioactively labeled. So when the uh, little beasts broke the, the sugar into bits, into molecular bits, carbon dioxide would be evolved. The carbon dioxide would be detected by a CO2 uh, a radioactive detector. And down on Earth, they would be beep, 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 beep as, the, as the, uh, uh, the counter. So they sent the thing, and that's what it did. It unrolled. And, and all hell broke loose at mission control because, sure enough, the number of counts per second began to rise and rose and rose and rose. And I, I wish I'd been there. I mean, they must have been out of their wigs. And then suddenly, bang, it shut down just like that. And everybody thought, oh, well, the machine stopped working. But they did all the tests, the machine was working. But somehow, life had stopped instantly like that. No more CO2. So they had a meeting at MIT, I remember the meeting, in which people discussed this result. And I can only caricature it by saying they took a vote. And the vote was there's no life on Mars. Uh, the vote was essentially that this must have been some sort of chemical reaction catalyzed by the dust particles, the finely divided clay particles that were picked up. Because as we know, very fine particles will catalyze various chemical reactions. And subsequently, that reaction was produced in the laboratory on Earth. I mean, you can do that. Now, what's the problem with this experiment? The problem with this experiment is that in order to detect life, they created an ecological niche for that life, right? I mean, a, a stuff that the life could live in. But what made them think that organisms on Mars had that particular ecological niche? In fact, most microorganisms, not most, but many microorganisms on Earth uh, don't break down uh, uh, glucose. Uh, most of them are not, uh, or many of them, not most, many of them are not aerobic. Uh, there are sulfur-fixing bacteria. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, how do they know that life on Mars uh, liked to eat sugar or, gave all, or, or broke it down and put out CO2? No way. In fact, if I had to choose knowing life on Earth, 
the majority of organisms on Earth will show evidence of wiggling or evidence of some kind of shape, cellular shape, as opposed to the majority of organisms behaving that way. This is an error of inventing an ecological niche before you've seen the organism that's in it. And so I come back to the main claim that the ecological niche of an organism does not exist without the organism. The physical world exists. The environment in that sense of temperature and moisture, not locally, but I mean globally, uh, exists without those organisms, although they have an effect on it. As you know, you're reminded every day that you're putting out all that CO2 and changing the world's uh, uh, so-called envir the environment. Uh, what is it that organisms do that uh, I claim constructs the environment. So the claim I want to make is that organisms do not fit into pre-existent environments, that organisms in their life activities, in their physiology and metabolism and behavior, construct around themselves a world. Now the first thing that organisms do by their sensuous-like activity, or the first thing I'll list, is that they determine by their activities, both their gross activities and their metabolic activities, what aspects of the external world are relevant to them and what aspects are irrelevant to them. So for example, if I, when we lived in Britain, there were birds that um, took snails and wrapped them on rocks and roof tiles to break the snails so they could eat them. And then there were crows who didn't do that. They had another way of living and, and great tits. Which, uh, now, those roof tiles and those stones in the ground were physically proximate to all the birds in our garden, but they were part of the environment of the thrushes that broke snails on those rocks, but they were irrelevant to the life of the other animals, or those other birds. Whether rocks are part of the environment of a bird is, the, is a question of whether they, the bird's activities make those rocks relevant to its life activities. Uh, because after all, there's all sorts of things around which are lying around in the, in, the, in the geographical vicinity of an organism, which the organism doesn't know anything about and are irrelevant to that organism, and others which the organism has made relevant to it. So the first thing that organisms do is to make things relevant to it. Um, twigs are relevant to a bird that makes nests out of twigs, and grass to an organism that makes nests out of grass, and holes in trees are relevant to woodpeckers, but not to other kinds of animals, and so on. So you get the point. What is relevant is determined by the life activity of the organism. And the life activity of the organism is influenced by, I wouldn't say determined, but influenced by its genes. So I could just as well say that the genes make the environment in the same sense that they make the organism. I mean, I'd say that, they, that they're, the fact that one bird has stones as part of its environment and another bird doesn't is a difference in their DNA. So I wanted to sort of go around, come back again. Um, OK, so they decide what's relevant. Secondly, every organism, every organism in the world, every species in the world, constructs, literally constructs a world around itself from bits and pieces, not only deciding what's relevant, but putting the relevant parts together in a way that is physiologically uh, meaningful and relevant to the organism. Uh, we constructed this, and it is indeed an important part of our environment. We would not be sitting here having this lecture outdoors tonight. That's for sure. Uh, and you are all familiar with the fact that bees make beehives and, 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 and moles bury in the ground and make tunnels and so on. Everybody knows those examples. But those we think of as special examples, very smart or very clever animals like ants and so on. But that's not the case. The case is that every organism is constructing the world around itself. Um, there was a man who went around uh, at one time, many years ago, showing photo, movie, moving pictures of living organisms, people among them, uh, taken with what are called Schlieren optics. Schlieren optics are a special form of optics which show differences in specific gravity, uh, well, actually, not specific gravity, but, but, but uh, light transmitting properties of gases through which the light is passing, so that you see like heat rising from a road, that sort of thing. And um, when he took pictures with Schlieren optics, what did he see and what he showed to us? 
every animal and plant that was photographed, he took a lot of photographs of people, and so let's talk about us, have around them, surrounding them, a boundary layer of moist, warm air, moister and warmer, that, these are terrestrial organisms I'm talking about, than the air outside. Moreover, that air for us is rising up over our bodies and over the tops of our heads and streaming off the top. Every one of you is sitting, not in this room in some broad sense, but in a little encapsulation of, of, of moist, warm air, which you are creating at every moment by your metabolism. You make the heat and you make the metabolic water that comes out in the form of this. Therefore, you are carrying around with you your own little world in which you're living. And not only are you carrying around with you, but every little animal or thing that's living on you, I don't pretend that you have many things living on you, but we all have, well, we all have microscopic organisms that live on us in our eyelids and so on, is living in that same boundary layer. And uh, plants have it, all animals have it, uh, at least all terrestrial animals. And that is the origin, I presume, um, there may be meteorologists who will tell me I'm wrong, and I would like to know. I presume that's the origin of the wind chill factor. I mean, have you ever thought, why does it get colder when the wind blows, even when the wind is the same temperature as the air around you? Why, why shouldn't, in fact, it should get warmer just from molecular movement. That's what I learned in, in physics. Uh, you get colder because the moist, warm boundary layer is blown away from you, and for the first time you are exposed to the real atmosphere. There it is. And uh, you don't have a chance for that protective boundary. That's a, that's a suggestion. That might be wrong. But the boundary layer is there, and it's there for all organisms. Uh, it means that any parasites that live on organ ex uh, ectoparasites that live on organisms are living in that boundary layer, and that is a condition for the evolution of those ectoparasites. Because if they get any bigger, even though before they were in the boundary layer, if they get bigger, they'll stick out of the boundary layer, and they'll be out in the, in, in the atmosphere there somewhere. Um, so organisms are creating that own little world around themselves metabolically. And that means that if you're going to do any interesting work on the environmental relations between organisms and the physiology of organisms and the outside world, you have to take the measurements at a microscopic level. You have to do what are called microclimatic measurements. You have to go out there with sensors and put them under the leaves of growing plants, on top of the leaves of growing plants. There's a different CO2 concentration on both sides. There's a different moisture concentration. Um, there's different light, clearly. You have to measure the, the, all the variables in a, in a field of corn at different heights above the soil. Uh, it matters whether the plants have lots of leaves or few leaves and so on. There was a uh, industry in agricultural uh, research for some time uh, called plant engineering in which an attempt was made to make plants more efficient in their fixation of carbon dioxide and light by engineering the shape of the, of the, of the leaves and the, and the number of leaves and the height of the leaves and, and so on. And they did that. They were able to make plants that uh, fit what they predicted ought to be more efficient users of the CO2 and the light. The trouble is when they made the plants different, then all the variables changed because now the CO2 concentration changed, uh, the light incidence changed, and they had to redesign the plants, and they were constantly chasing a moving, uh, a moving problem uh, the, the, because it's the plant that determines how much CO2 there is there. It's the plant that determines how much light gets through from here to there and so on. So it's very important to understand that organisms by their shape and morphology, uh, shape and, uh, and physiology and metabolic rates create a world around themselves uh, and all, and, and, and taking the weather measurements at the top of the building tell you nothing. And indeed, uh, Canadians know that. The Canadian Department of Agriculture puts out vast tables of microclimatic measurements made at various heights in cornfields. I think the Americans have not yet become hip to that notion, but they, but they should. Okay, so organisms then create a world around themselves, whether it's a building, a nest, or just the boundary layer, or just choosing where to go. And I'll tell you one more example so you understand the, the general idea. Many years ago, um, a student of, uh, of uh, a man named Colin Pittendrick, a well-known uh, uh, student of Drosophila, 
decided to ask why it is that there were some populations of a certain species of Drosophila that were able to live in xeric, rather dry environments like out there in the desert, whereas others required a moisture environment. So he brought the flies in from nature and he built a gradient and he let the flies choose where they would move in the gradient. And that was a gradient of moisture. So he put the flies in the middle and some flies went to the left and some went to the left and some went to the right. And what he expected to see was that the flies that came from the Zurich environment were more comfortable where it's dry and they would move to the dry part. And the flies that came from the Mesic environment were more comfortable in the wet and they would move to the wet part. But exactly the opposite happened. The flies that came from the more Zurich environments moved more quickly to the moist part of the, of the gradient. And it took him about 10 seconds to realize that of course what are called Zurich and Mesic environments are made in weather stations. The real issue is what the microclimate and microenvironment of these little fruit flies is. And they weren't, there were no flies living in Zurich environments. They were all living in Mesic environments. In order to live in a, what we call a Zurich environment, you have to be very good at finding the moist microhabitats. And if you're very good at finding them, then you survive. Otherwise, you're exposed to the nasty dry desert and you die. And fruit flies die very quickly because the waxes in their cuticle uh, melt and all the moisture comes out and they're dead in no time. So um, the organisms then seek out actively by behavioral phenomena those microclimates and microenvironments in which they can survive better. And in that sense then they are determining their own environment because the environment of those flies is not out in the middle of the sand in the middle of the desert. It's in little cracks and crevices. Okay, so that's how organisms uh, create their own environment. But they don't just create their own environments. They also, at every moment, are both destroying and creating the environment. Producing and destroying. Every act of consumption is an act of production, and every act of production is an act of consumption. At every instant, we are consuming oxygen and giving out CO2, right? Um, we are changing the world. But it isn't only people who are doing that. You know, every aerobic organism in the world is taking up oxygen and turning it into carbon dioxide. And the world is changing as a consequence. But fortunately, there are some organisms that are green and take the carbon dioxide part of the time and turn it back into oxygen again. Uh, in fact, as you know, all the free oxygen in the world was put there by plants. Uh, before there were plants, uh, oxygen is very reactive and, and, and free oxygen is not a stable part of the atmosphere. Uh, there was a large amount of carbon dioxide and virtually no oxygen. Plants made it mostly oxygen, 18% oxygen, and reduced the carbon dioxide to four, what is it, four one hundredths of one percent or whatever it is. Uh, what happened to all the carbon dioxide that used to be there? It was deposited in limestone and in fossil fuels by living organisms. All that limestone used to be free carbon dioxide. Um, so the world as a whole is changed by the organisms. But it, it's not just the world as a whole that's changed by it. The organisms change their very own world in which they're living in very important ways. Every species, not just the human species, but every species, is in the process of destroying its own environment. Every species breathes in something it needs and exhales something it doesn't want. Every species leaves fecal matter. Uh, every species uh, uh, is in the process of, fe of fouling its own nest. At the same time, all kinds of species, I attempt to say every one, but I can't give examples for everyone, are in the process of changing the world around them in their environment in a way that's advantageous to them, not just human beings. Uh, plants, I mean, you want to talk about dumb organism, how about plants, you know, they don't think about anything, they don't move much, uh, but they create by their metabolic activities uh, a world, not just above ground but below ground, which is hospitable to their own growth. Plants put out roots, the roots change the physical structure of the soil, 
in ways that are advantageous for taking up moisture. Uh, there are things called humic acids, which are excreted through the roots of, of vascular plants. Those humic acids change the chemical composition of the soil, promoting the growth of mycorrhizal fungi, which then in an association with the plant uh, root hairs, uh, nourish the plants. Plants are out there farming for themselves, so to speak. Uh, and they're doing that all the time. And, and the change in, in both chemical and physical structure of the soil created by plants is, has a powerful effect on that. Uh, so organisms are both creating and destroying their own environment at all times. Sometimes that creation and destruction takes very interesting and important uh, forms. For example, uh, it is not human beings who invented the struggle between generations. Um, in New England, where we come from, uh, it used to be that there were vast pine forests. Uh, along came the lumber companies and the paper companies and thought, oh, we've got it made. They bought huge acreages of these pine forests, white pine, and cut it down for paper and lumber, expecting, of course, that if they waited long enough, Back would come the pines, but they don't. When you cut pine trees in northern New England or middle New England, what comes in instead are hardwoods. And every time you cut a pine grove, in come hardwoods. Pines don't come in. What was discovered by many years of, of research and historical investigation was that pine trees are a middle stage of succession of the forests in New England. That first you have, and, and that pines come in first, into abandoned fields. New England in, 18, in, in 1840, at least a part of New England, in Vermont where we lived, our town had more people in 1840 than it's had since. And then when the western lands were opened, everybody picked up and said, I'm not going to farm this stony ground anymore. And they all went west to Pennsylvania, Ohio, and so on with deep soils, abandoning their farms. Many farms were also abandoned in the Depression. When you abandon a field in that region, the first things that come in are scrubby uh, herbs and so on, then largely what are called old field pines, single pines that come in. And pretty soon the pines grow up and you get a pine grove. But pine seedlings cannot grow under the shadow of their own parents. The pine seedlings that, 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 that start to grow under the shadow of these pines are stunted and don't make it. At the same time, there are hardwoods being blown in from other places or brought in by animals. And they have a somewhat better ability to grow up. The moment you cut the old pine trees, those hardwood seedlings take over and completely change the composition of the population into hardwoods. And that has been repeated experimentally. And you can see it if you get in an airplane and fly from Boston to Chicago. Look down, you'll see the stone walls marking the old fields. You'll see the pines coming into them. And then if you keep going, you'll see older fields in which the pines are gone and the hardwoods have taken their place. Pines are weeds. I know you may not think of pines as weeds. I'm talking about the white pine in, in eastern. Are weeds, i.e., plants which can only grow in disturbed habitats and which then change the nature of that disturbed habitat in such a way as to be hostile to the next generation of their own species. That's what a weed is. A weed is a plant, not, not a plant that comes into cornfields. That's, that's a special kind of weed. Weeds, weedy plants are plants that come, or weedy animals for that matter, come into disturbed habitats and then change the nature of the habitat so they can't replace themselves and make it available to new forms. Uh, and weeds are a classic example of how organisms make and remake the environment, sometimes in ways that are ultimately hostile to the next generation. So that's a long-winded way, but I think I have to go over and over to, to convince you that it isn't just people who are destroying and making their own world. It's organisms in general at every instant are making and destroying their own. That's the process of construction. The next thing that, and I mean, I can think of lots of stories. Uh, uh, Mort Saul, yeah, some of you know, he once said, uh, remember, he said, uh, no matter how cruel, nasty, and evil you've been today, uh, every time you take a breath, you make a flower happy. <laughs> 
And I mean, yeah, that's the way you have to think about the interaction of organisms. Uh, the next thing organisms do is to uh, do mathematics. Uh, they can do both integration and differentiation. Um, that is to say, they do statistical averaging, for example. Uh, when uh, a tree comes into flower, depends not on what the temperature is the day the tree comes into flower or how much light there is. What the tree is doing is accumulating uh, degree days. It's, it's doing a time integral of the varying degree days uh, until the total number of degree days gets big enough and then they flower. Um, all kinds of organisms are time averaging. Uh, we are time averaging. I'm time averaging, and as you are. Uh, if you didn't time average, you couldn't, you couldn't live. Uh, you eat just as well in the wintertime as you do in the summertime. Why is that? Because you have mechanisms of storage of, uh, of, of nutrients. And storage is a form of, of, of time averaging, of taking the average. So that, for example, uh, oak trees store energy in the form of acorns so that when those acorns fall on the ground and they germinate, the plant can, can come out. That's a stored average of photosynthesis that occurred during the spring and summer when that tree was uh, producing the acorns, which then next, next year will, will sprout. Um, then squirrels time average by gathering the acorns and, and uh, put them away for the winter. Uh, time so or animals will time average using the seeds of plants. We time average uh, by using the time averaging of the potato plant. Potato tubers are a accumulation of photosynthetic uh, material, uh, which is then an, a storage of energy which the, which the potato can use to sprout. We then take the potatoes and put them in cellars or, or storage facilities, so we're averaging over summer and winter. And then there's a, a form of time averaging that people use that no other organism can use, and that's money. Money is a time averaging device. Uh, uh, because you don't pay, you don't, there are, there are so-called futures markets which even out the price of potatoes over the year, and they only fluctuate a little bit even when they're not being made by the potato plants. So there are all kinds of mechanisms. And then animals have yet another form of time averaging. When they eat, and there's plenty of food around, uh, they store fat. And then that fat is used during lean periods. I mean, we, men have it in their greater omentum. Uh, women have it in other parts of their bodies. But like all mammals, they have mechanisms for fat storage, which carries them over lean and, and, and fat periods. Uh, bears hibernate and use up the fat they have in them and so on. So, so th that time integration is a very, very common feature of organisms. Tubers, fat, uh, cultural things like the potlatch of the Northwestern Indians and so on are all time averaging devices for averaging out the good and the bad times. Uh, organisms also do uh, mathematical differentiation. That is to say, organisms will respond in important ways to changes in the rates of things, if not to the rates themselves. Uh, the most famous example is of the water flea, uh, Daphnia, which is sometimes sexual and sometimes asexual. Daphnia reproduce asexually by, by parthenogenesis. Whether there's a lot of food or a little food, whether there's a lot of oxygen or a little oxygen, whether the temperature is high or temperature is low, until a change occurs in the temperature or food or oxygen. So it goes from high to low or low to high, uh, rapidly or rapidly a little bit of oxygen to a lot of oxygen, or vice versa. And when that rapid change occurs, that's a signal for the organism to be sexual. And they then produce males, and the males mate with the females. And I can give you a long adaptive story about why that's true, but I won't bother. This is simply evidence of the fact that organisms can change their life history patterns in response to rates of change in the environment, not just in the levels of what's out there. So organisms have, they do statistics, and they do mathematics. Um, 
Finally, let me say that organisms um, transduce signals from the outside world into entirely different signals, which are not, don't resemble the signals that come in. Um, the hot air that is accumulating in this room as a consequence both of my speech and the metabolism that you're all engaged in, which is increasing the temperature in here, well, there may be air conditioning, I don't know, but would increase the temperature, is not felt by your livers as an increase in the mean free path of, of molecules. Uh, you know, it doesn't get hotter in you as it gets hotter outside. Uh, that signal, which is a signal of, of, of molecular striking of your, of your outer skin and so on, is converted by your metabolism into changes in the levels of various chemicals in your body, including hormones and so on, because you are homeostatic organisms who have those internal chemical means to keep your body temperature constant inside despite the change in temperature outside. And that can only be done because the nature of the physical signal, which is an increase in the mean free path of the air molecules, the temperature, is being transduced into a change in the concentration of chemicals. And that occurs constantly. Uh, look, when we used to go out into the desert to collect flies, we'd occasionally come across a sidewinder. I don't know if any of you have ever come across a sidewinder, but it's not a pleasant experience. Um, when you come across a sidewinder, the photons which have impinged on your retinas and the, uh, the rarefactions of the air that have impinged on your eardrums are converted instantly, or almost instantly, into a chemical uh, change inside of you, namely the production of vast amounts of adrenaline. Notice, please, that that's species specific, because I assume, I don't know, of course, but I assume that when one sidewinder sees another one, a uh, somewhat different chemical reaction occurs, especially if they're of opposite sex. Uh, so that is specific to your genotype as a, as a species. So transduction of signals is another part of the life activity of organisms which changes the immediate environment of the organism, uh, at least as it impinges on the organism internally. And you have an internal environment as, as well as an external one. So let me sum up all those features by saying that the best metaphor for the relationship between organism and environment is one in which the organism constructs an environment by its metabolic activities, by its behavior, by its shape, and so on. And uh, every species has its own environment. And indeed, since organisms differ one from another within a species, each one of you has a somewhat different environment than each other one of you. And you say, well, OK, that may be true, but look, uh, how about gravity? I mean, uh, we didn't invent the law of gravity. Well, we did invent the law of gravity, but, but we didn't uh, create gravitation. Um, uh, you can't get away from gravity. Gravity is part of the environment of every organism. Well, not quite right. Uh, if you are a bacterium, uh, you barely know gravity, especially if you're in a liquid medium. I mean, the sedimentation rate of bacteria in a liquid medium is pretty slow. Um, Gravity, because it's inversely proportional uh, to the square of the distance, and especially because it depends on the mass, um, barely affects uh, organisms like bacteria. It's our genes that make us subject to gravity because we're big in size. If we were as little as bacteria, it wouldn't bother us. On the other hand, there are forces that are very important in the life of any individual bacterium, which we don't perceive. Um, that is a, when I move my arms, it doesn't affect you because gravity uh, falls off so rapidly. Uh, also, I am not knocked back and forth on this stage by the bounding of the molecules, by Brownian movement. But bacterial cells are. If you look at bacterial cells in a liquid culture, they're being moved around like this because they're small enough that the Brownian motion uh, affects them. So whether or not a universal force, and Brownian motion is universal, gravity is universal, but whether those forces are effective in the life of an organism depends, among other things, on the size of the organism. But what is influential in the size of the organism? Well, in the big sense, again, it's your genes. I mean, the difference, 
between me and bacteria is largely in my genes and its genes. So we come to the very curious sort of counter proposition that although the genes don't make the organism, uh, the environment in which the organism uh, exists, which is important in the determination of what the organism looks like, is in turn made by the genes. That is to say, what you have, and here's the sort of the bottom line, is a kind of uh, co-determination uh, of organism and environment, in which both of them are both causes and effects. Now, this is something that any physics student knows perfectly well. The world is full of situations in which the dynamics of the situation are, if I can put it in, in, in childish mathematical terms, there's a pair of coupled differential equations. The rate of change of x with time depends both on the state of x and the state of y, and the rate of change of y in time depends on the state of x and the state of y. And you've got to solve those equations simultaneously or you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we have for too long as taken the rules of evolution to be that the environment is autonomous and has its own processes. The rate of change of environment is a consequence of purely physical forces in the external world. The rate of change of organisms in evolution is a function of the state of the organisms and the, and the changes in environment. But that decouples the two. The coupling is done by rewriting that to understand that the rate of change of environment with time depends not only on the state of the external world, but also on the state of the organism itself, which is creating and constructing that environment. And so you have a pair of coupled processes in which organism and environment co-evolve. Every organism is constantly in the state of both causing and being caused by the evolution of its own environment. So among other things, this has a practical meaning uh, in, the, in the politics of the world. The slogan, let's not destroy the environment, or let's keep the, the environment, is a senseless slogan because the environment is changing all the time and there's nothing you can do about it. Thus, there's nothing you can do about the fact that it's changing. What you hope is you can do something about the direction that it changes. You might have some influence on making the environment change in a way that's better for, for whoever you want it to be better for. Uh, but you can't stop the world and say, I'm going to get off. The environment of every organism is evolving as the organisms evolve, in addition to the geotectonic processes and so on that are going on. Um, I began yesterday uh, by talking about the history of evolutionary thought. I want to leave you with, this is probably as good a time as any, uh, with uh, one of the most important uh, evolutionary statements ever made, made in the middle of the 18th century uh, by one of the enci French encyclopedists, uh, Denis Diderot, uh, who uh, in, the, uh, in, in his perhaps most famous book, uh, Le Rêve de D'Alembert, the, the, the Dream of, of D'Alembert, who was a, a, a scientist and philosopher. And I give it to you first in French to show off and then give it to you in English. Just uh, In Le Rêve de D'Alembert, he says, uh, Tout change, tout passe, il n'y a que le tout qui reste. Everything changes, everything passes, it's only the totality that remains. I think he was probably wrong about that as well. Uh, I don't think the totality in any sense is going to remain. But, but this is the right way to understand evolution, that uh, organisms and their environments are inseparable and co-defining and co-evolving and co-constructing. Clearly, there's no one interested, so. Oh, I'm sorry, you're doing the calling. No. Oh, we're pretty safe. I have a question about your Drosophila example, where you talk about them seeking out a more moist sort of micro environment or micro. Can you relate that to your idea about them influencing their environment? Yes, part of my talk, which, which I didn't have time to give, including some pictures is uh, 
what happens when different genetic types of Drosophila compete with each other, so-called, in a tube of, of well-defined medium. It turns out that if you count out the number of Drosophila eggs into a well-defined medium on which yeast is growing, the rate of survival of those eggs to adulthood increases as you increase the number of eggs for a while, reaching a maximum at about, in this particular experiment, eight individuals per vial, and then starts to decrease again. That is to say that the activities of those, the eggs of Drosophila, by the way, hatch into little maggots, larvae. Those maggots tunnel in the food. And the process of tunneling in the food, they're doing farming. They're creating surface area on which the yeast grows. And the consequence of that is that they, for a while, produce more than they consume. And the result is that you get an increase in survivorship on their activity. And then when you put too many in, you begin to get a decrease in survivorship. The consequence of that kind of activity in, uh, of Drosophila is that if you do experiments putting two kinds of Drosophila, two different genetic types of Drosophila in the food, at the intermediate density, which is the optimal density for Drosophila, both kinds survive equally well. But at the lower densities, one kind survives much better than the other. And at the highest densities, one kind survives much better than the other. They're, but they're equally, they do equally well when they're farming efficiently. Now, another consequence of that is, and I think it's in answer to your question, is if I do a competition experiment of genotype A against genotype B, A will beat B in this little experiment. I then take B and try it against C. B beats C. So A beats B and B beats C. Now, every economist knows in this room uh, that according to the rules of utility theory, if A beats B and B beats C, A better beat C. This is called transitivity. But when you do the experiment, most of the time, or much of the time, C beats A. That is to say that the outcome of a particular interaction between two genetic types depends on the particular two genetic types, and you can't predict what A will do against C until you try it. And that's because there are multi -dimen multiple dimensions along which organisms interact. So A might be beat B because A is bigger than B. B might be beat C because B is faster at getting the food than C. But C might be beat A because C is smarter than A. I don't know what it means to be smarter for a fruit fly, but you get the point. That, that each interaction has a unique biology because the organisms are creating a world, each one in its own way, and the rates of that creation change. And so the rule of transitivity and utility theory doesn't count in biology. I mean, those of you who do uh, economic utility theory I don't know that it applies to people either, but I have to leave that to you. Uh, but we have, by the way, we do have experiments with people in which an, a person will choose A against B when those are the only two opportunities, or will choose B against C when those are the only two opportunities. But if you give them A and C, uh, counterintuitively, they'll choose C over A. Uh, that's bad news for ec economists, and I don't know what they do about it. But, uh, but that's the rule for organisms. It's different strokes for different folks. And it's because they're creating their own environment. And that question was raised uh, yesterday in the question period. And I had hoped to have more time to, to talk about that. But because organisms are creating their own worlds in different ways, there's no predictability of what A will do against B and B against C and C against A. You've got to do the experiment, unfortunately. Look, uh, before you get away, let me try my other mantra on you, which is, comes out of this discussion. And that is a difference between organisms and other physical systems. I mean, organisms and physical systems, of course. The difference between organisms and other physical systems that people study is that most physical systems that people study are either extremely large or extremely small. And generally, they are home, internally homogeneous uh, to, in a functional sense. So if you want to know about planets going around the sun, you don't have to know too much. You have to know how, how much, how, what their mass is and, and, you know, and how, fast, how far out they are from the sun, and a couple of things. Three or four things are enough to predict. And if you're talking about electrons or protons, you don't have to, you gotta know how charming they are and a few other things like that, but you don't have to know much. To know what an organism is going to do requires a vast amount of information because organisms have two properties which are very inconvenient. They are intermediate in size, neither big enough to make gravitation very important in their interactions with other organisms, nor small enough 
uh, to behave like elementary particles. They're intermediate in size. And they're internally heterogeneous, functionally. The consequence that an organism, a living organism, is the nexus of a very large number of weakly determining causal pathways. And that makes it extremely difficult to be able to predict what's going to happen next when you put two organisms together. Let me say, let me define finally on this point what the difference is between being sick and being well is in my view. A normal or well organism is an organism whose life is the nexus of a large number of weakly defining interacting causal pathways. A sick organism is precisely an organism that is under the sway of a single determining causal pathway. You know, I got a diseased liver or I have an idée fixe uh, or something of the sort. No, no, I mean, that's what we mean by illness, that your life is determined deeply by one powerful force, whereas the well individual is unconscious, if I may say, of all those interacting forces because they're... Now, this makes extreme difficulties for experimental biology because an experiment is precisely an attempt to analyze a large number of weakly defining forces by holding everything constant except one thing and tweaking that one thing strongly enough to have an effect. The problem is that if I, first of all, one of the problems is holding everything constant. But when you hold everything else constant and make a major uh, perturbation in one, how does that scale onto the normal situation of everything changing and everything having small perturbations? In genetics, we learned early that major mutations may often give you a very false notion of, the, of, of how organisms are, are actually operating because you're making a big change in something where ordinarily the control systems are dealing with very small perturbations. And that's a serious problem for experimental biology, and I don't have an answer for it because the analysis requires holding everything else constant as much as you can and moving one thing. But all of those who, of you who work on nonlinear interacting systems know that when you hold everything else constant and make a big perturbation in one element, that's a very poor predictor of what happens when everything is varying and you make small perturbations. I mean, nonlinear large interacting systems are nasty that way. Yeah. Uh, except for ectoparasites, how do pelagic fish you know, create their own environment? By choosing, for example, the depth at which they swim, by choosing, if I use the word choosing, I mean, I don't mean you know, they think about it, uh, by, by deciding, if, I, if you like, um, uh, whether they go in schools or singly, uh, by uh, browsing on particular kinds of food, uh, it's, the, it's the organism that decides what to eat. And in fact, many organisms, as you know, have so-called uh, uh, search patterns, which they switch depending on the abundance of things. And so something becomes the food of something when everybody decides that's a good thing to eat, and a little later, something else becomes the food. So fish living, uh, act, uh, organisms living in aquatic environments also uh, have, have change. Look, let me give you the best example I can, one I've actually observed myself. Uh, if you dive in the barrier reef in Australia, in the coral pools, you will observe well over 100 species of fish living in this coral pool, which is half as big as this room, completely surrounded by coral with a sandy, sandy floor. And each fish there is making a living in a different way uh, out of this uh, bunch of coral. Some are nibbling at the coral, and you see the coral being dropping down to the surface. Some are taking only what sticks out of the surface. Some are eating down here. Some are eating up there. Some are eating other things which are floating around, uh, just in the way they eat. And those behavioral phenomena in this fairly simple environment, although it's got a lot of micro complexity in it, uh, those different fish are doing things that are, if I may allow it to be a genetic determinist moment, dictated by their DNA. Uh, so uh, that's my example from fish. In fact, I was taught old-fashioned ecology when I was a student that the chief important thing in the ocean was at what depth you were. That determined what light reached you, that determined what temperature there was, and blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, nobody believes that anymore, I think. But. I believe mean, it's a term of privilege to ask a question. Uh, if a religious belief or an environment, why, in the vice of evil, there are five different species of um, different cats, or simple as different cats, why is convergence the difference? Uh, I'm glad that somebody who's an expert asked the question of convergence because that's a very important point. Convergence exists not only in the Pleistocene, it exists now. There are, the, there are the bird fauna of the Chaparral in North America and extraordinarily similar bird fauna made up of totally different species, unrelated species, in the Matorral of Chile. So to say that organisms create their own environments is not the same as saying that they, well, let me quote a very famous political economist who said, men, I'm sorry about that, men make their own history, but not as they choose. That is to say, there are constraints. There are constraints on how you can make a world. Uh, and uh, that has to be remade within those constraints. And I think the question for us has to be, how to find out what those constraints on the manufacture of the environment is. But convergence certainly exists, and that's an indication that you don't make your own history as you choose. There are ways, it's, it's like what I talked about yesterday, those big holes in the, uh, in the occupancy of, of the space of organisms. There are some parts of space that are prohibited. There are other parts of space that are easy to get to, other parts of space that are hard to get to. And that would be my answer to you. It's, it's a vacuous answer because it doesn't have any concrete in it. It might indicate some direction of research. I don't know if that satisfies you. Well, it's important that it does. Is it? I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Could you say it again? Just for me. Well, you have a, like, take the human species. Um, you know, their immune system has changed over time, but it continues to change, but it has this ability to, like, shuffle the genes, and it has contained within the genes uh, mechanisms to generate randomness. So, so it seems like, it seems like randomness is a really important player, just, like, even in terms of survival. And somehow the organism come up, come up with this. Well, I don't think that the organisms came up with randomness. I mean, that's, that's a basic element of the interaction of molecules, uh, even at the quantum level, because you have different vibrational states and so on. What organisms have done, however, in their evolution is to modulate the effects of randomness on their growth and development. And let me give us one specific example. I talked about a lot of randomness in cells arising because of the low concentration of molecules that are important, seven of this kind, five of the other. There's one kind of molecule which is terribly important to a cell and which is present in one copy only, uh, at least in bacteria, and that's DNA. Now, think about what it would be like if at the division of a cell, random parts of the DNA went to uh, to uh, different cells. I mean, that would be death. What has happened in the evolution, molecular evolution uh, is that precisely because DNA is present in one copy only, I mean, it's present in two copies in us, but it's one only in a bacterium, an extremely complex mechanism has evolved to guarantee that each offspring cell gets one and only one copy. That's what the whole business about DNA replication is all about. Otherwise, we wouldn't have double-stranded DNA, it would be single-stranded. And at one time, nobody in this room probably remembers that, well, some of us may, uh, there was a theory before bacterial genetics was understood very well, that in fact bacteria simply divided their, their genes sort of randomly. Uh, and a lot of claim was made for that. But, but I think it's very important that that case, the, the greater the potential noise, the greater the selection pressure to create uh, uh, systems which damp the noise. 
And uh, we can see that in a variety of ways. Uh, some computer simulation work done uh, by Peter Goss has shown, has asked, answered the following question. Why is it that when you look at the molecular details of networks, metabolic networks in cells, that you so often see not just redundancy, but an awful lot of redundancy? They say somehow the control systems don't depend just on one wiring loop, but there are many wiring loops, all of which are doing the same job in alternative ways. So if you cut one, you'd still get the same feedback. If you cut two, you'd still get the same feedback. So why are they so sloppy or profligate? And what he found was by his simulations that even if you cut one or cut two or got rid of them, the cell would still go through what it was going through, but the effect of noise would be greater that what the reduplication and apparent profligacy of excess duplication was doing was holding down the effect of noise. And that's one mechanism which cells can use to reduce noise effects, and that is to have alternative duplicate pathways of, of, uh, of feedback control. I, I guarantee to offend everybody. 